Welcome to the Messy Antics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Messy Antics. Uh, this is Rabbi Jonathan, who is joined today with Rabbi David, Rabbi Toby, and Rabbi Eric. And today we are going to be discussing the uh, oftentimes, sometimes confusing uh, distinction that's made between grace and law, and why some people make that distinction, and why we do not believe in such a distinction, um, uh, not only in our own lives, but in our particular wing of the Messianic Jewish movement. Yeah, Rabbi Eric here, and I wanted to point out just a couple of things as we delve into this. First of all, we have to define what is grace and what is law in order to understand what's going on in these concepts. And a lot of people think grace is like deodorant that you put on that covers the stink of sin, Mm -hmm. Uh, but then you just keep sinning. Like there's no requirement to actually do anything about your sin because God's grace covers your sin, so your responsibility goes away. And that's not actually true. Probably the best definition I've found for grace is that grace makes up the difference between our best efforts and God's demanded perfection. In other words, when we do all that we can do, God's grace makes up the difference between our best efforts and God's expectations. And then when it comes to Torah or law, it's instructions, is God's instructions to us. It's not so much laws as in a legal document with you must do this and you must do that, but it's God's instructions for life. And when we first get introduced to the concepts of of grace, which uh, Rabbi David began talking a little about, when we see, for instance, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So grace existed in Noah's day, not just in the New Testament. Grace is not something that all of a sudden, two-thirds of the way through the Bible, the Lord said, hey, you know, I might need to provide some kind of means of redemption for my people, so let's sprinkle a little grace in here. God looked at how much of a train wreck we can and went, oh, I knew I forgot something in the recipe. Yeah, it just occurred to me <laughs> that I might should have provided some salt in this uh, recipe. It, it just doesn't work that way. So so Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but why did he find, what was that grace? How, how did it qualify? And it says Noah was righteous, which meant he did the things that God had commanded him. And because of his doing something righteous, doing the righteous acts of God, he found grace as opposed to those who were not doing the righteous actions of God, who ultimately were judged and found judgment because of their actions. So grace is a response, is God's way of saying, yes, you did this. Now, was Noah perfect? Absolutely not. Not in the ways of, of absolutely everything. But Noah was found righteous because his heart was to do the things of God, and because his heart was desiring to do the things of God, he was counted as righteous because of God's grace uh, in a world that was falling apart, very much like ours is today. And as we as we look at this, I just want to clarify uh, one thing with this discussion of grace and law, and I'm actually going to, to use the language of grace versus law, because a lot of times that's the way some within the body of Messiah kind of approach it, is it's grace versus law. If you obey the Torah, if you obey the law, you're working contrary to grace, which came to free us from the law, uh, which is kind of the mentality that's out there. But uh, I, I want to throw out there that without the Torah, without what's often called the law, although it's not all law, it does contain some law for Eretz Israel, for the land of Israel, it is not all law. Um, the the reality is, is without the Torah, none of us would really grasp or understand the reality of grace to begin with. Um, and, and I'll throw out one brief example. And by the way, this is Rabbi David speaking, but I'll throw out one brief example. Uh, and that is that um, when we look at, uh, for instance, the uh, 
the, the, the commandment in the Torah to take a wayward son, right? This is one that I talk about a lot. Uh, we, we take a, a wayward son out to the, the leaders, the elders of the city at the gate, and we, the, the parents would then say, my son is, you know, worthless and, uh, a drunkard and whatever. And so we're going to, uh, you know, they, they basically stone the kid so that the guy can't, you know, continue to create issues within the nation of Israel. Well, when we look at this, what happens a lot of times, first off, is people will go, oh, it's a pretty messed up commandment. It's a pretty messed up narrative there. Uh, I can't believe God would say something like that. But when we look at this, there's actually the evidence of grace and mercy that is wrapped up in this one specific issue. For instance, first and foremost, in order for capital punishment by Torah, in order for capital punishment to be carried out, the witnesses bringing the accusation have to be the first ones to throw the stones. And in this case, the wayward sons, the witness against the wayward son would be the parents. So the parents would have to be the first ones to throw the stones. Second is, we're not talking a three, four, five-year-old that just refuses to clean up their room or refuses to, to do their laundry or whatever. We're talking about an adult son. It says who is a drunkard. I've never met a three-year-old drunkard. Um, but when we're, I, I've met a lot of drunkards who acted like three year olds, but I've never met a three year old drunkard. But when we're when we're dealing with this, it's it's a grown man who their parents have realized that there's no hope left for them. But the reality is, is no parent is ever going to say there's no hope left for my kid, right? And so history tells us, rabbinic literature tells us, tradition tells us that there has never been an instance in uh, the history of the Jewish people in which the stoning of a wayward son was ever carried out. Because number one, the parent would never want to say there's no hope left for my kid. Number two, the parents would not want to participate in stoning their kid. And number three, it wasn't about the kid being stoned. It was about the idea of grace and mercy in the fact that what was due that kid for being a train wreck is not coming to that kid, even though they're a train wreck, because their parents love them and there's grace and mercy wrapped in there. And so when we look at the idea of grace and mercy, yes, this is a pretty stringent command. But we see the beauty of that grace and mercy of God carried out in the fact that historically, traditionally, it was never actually followed through on by anybody in uh, the history of the Jewish people. Yeah, I think it's is it um, is it's chen is the the word for the Hebrew word for grace um, means uh, favor, and Moses actually uses the term. When he's talking, you know, to God, God's just about had it with Israel. He's like, "I'm starting over, Moses. I'll start with you, but we don't, we don't need the rest of the nation." And you know, Moses, you know, declares to Adonai, "If you have found no, if you don't go with us as a nation as a whole, then you know, then I don't want to go either. You know, we, uh, if I have found favor in your eyes, you know, please go with Israel as a whole. Go with Israel as a nation." And that's when God says, "Okay, I'll go. You know, I will. I will go with." You know, uh, because you have, I have found, uh, sorry, you have found favor in my eyes and I will go with, on your behalf, go with Israel as a whole. And, you know, Moses is a shadow. He's an archetype of Yeshua, of the greatest prophet right. to come. And, you know, we, we, we kind of come under the same thing with Yeshua because Yeshua found favor, found merit in the eyes of Adonai. Because he was the perfect one, the one who was found without sin. When we come under his covering, when we come to Yeshua and abide under his life, under his blood that was shed for us, we, like Israel with Moses, inherit the favor of God on behalf of Yeshua, you know, on, on through his behalf. It, it's not – so again, it, grace is not something that we necessarily did. You know, it's no. – it's, you know, right, all... grace is is this amazing thing that God provides. Yeah. You know, the usually when we have this discussion or when people bring this up, it's as uh, Rabbi David said, a, a verses grace versus Torah, and then when they apply Torah, they're implying Torah as if legalism was the right view of Torah. In other words, that if you obey the Torah without error then your obedience will result in God's grace, which covers you. In other words, you have to be perfect in every way and obedient and work your way to redemption or salvation by your actions. When that's not what it's saying, God, by yeah. his grace, provided instructions for us to follow, but his grace also intercedes for us 
at the times when we fail to perfectly align with his word. On the other side of that, there's easy believism or greasy grace, I've heard it called by some people, <laughs> where uh, you have no responsibility, where you know they look at the verses that say your soul cannot sin – uh, because of your faith in Messiah, and they misapply it and say there, that I, no matter what I do, I could commit adultery, I could rob a bank, I could do this, and God's grace has already paid for my sin, so I have no responsibility to do anything at all because by doing anything, yeah. then I have worked my way to salvation. Or by avoiding anything extra, you know, where yeah. you know, our our view of God is let us do as much as we can to reveal God to the world. And Yeshua gives us the same uh, command, which is, you know, let your, let your good works shine before men yeah. that way your Father in Heaven may be glorified. And I've, I've had such defeatist conversations with, uh, you know, friends and coworkers who were Christians who, you know, when I explained my life, my lifestyle, you know, as a Messianic Gentile, you know, they're, I'm living for God, trying to you know, do absolutely as much as I can for God, because why not? Like, he's given me a life to do as much as I possibly can right. for him. First kingdom, and you know they would. And the, one of the first things I would hear is, you know, well, you know, you sin every day, right? Which is a very Southern Baptist, you know, thing that, like, you know, well, you can't be perfect, and it's like, well, but it's not. I'm not. I know that. Like, there's no, right. you know, the, the the Bible never insinuates that you will be perfect, but it, there, you are instructed to pursue it. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's, that's like one of the things that we've said quite a bit at CMC recently. Is you know, there's the 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 phrase that's very popular, right? That God wants to meet you where you are, right? The problem is, is God doesn't want us to stay there. He'll absolutely meet us where we are because he understands we're not where he wants us to be, but he doesn't want us to stay there. And we just came out of the high holy day season, uh, or particularly out of the the uh, the ten days of awe. And uh, when we're when we're talking about Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur and the 10 days of all, we're looking at this idea of repentance and restoration and teshuvah, or returning back to the Lord. And uh, as Rabbi Eric was saying earlier, we, we look at this idea of sin, and the Hebrew word for sin is chata, which very literally just means missed the mark. Right, and so when we make teshuvah, it's that we're turning back around because we realize we missed the mark. I think about GPS units, right? When I'm following directions on my GPS, I'm extremely ADD, uh, which I'm pretty sure most of us in this uh, room right now are. But I'm extremely ADD, and it's really easy when I'm following directions from from the the uh, maps app on my phone or, or what have you that I'll forget to look at the road, and and I'll hear take a turn now and I'm four lanes out from being able to get over to the exit. And I'm <laughs> like, well, 90 miles per hour. And all of a sudden you hear, you know, well, you don't hear it anymore, but when you had fixed GPS units in your car, you would hear recalculating, recalculating, right? And, and it recalculates your route and tells you how to come back around, either swing a U-turn or take this exit and loop back around or whatever. Um, and that's the reality of what repentance is, is it's, it's recalculating our route back to where we were supposed to be. And when we talk about this idea of grace versus law, the problem is, is it comes from cherry picking scripture. Uh, Rabbi Toby and I were talking about this on the way over to uh, Bredam today is, right. uh, is, you know, we, we have this really bad tendency of cherry picking scripture. We were talking about it in context to the conversation that exists perpetually within the Messianic Jewish movement as to whether or not Gentiles should keep Torah, and if so, what that looks like, and how do we maintain distinctions between Jews and Gentiles if Gentiles are doing Jewish things, and yada, yada, yada. The issue is, is I think one of the problems, this whole conversation of grace versus law comes from Romans 6.14 that says, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And everybody cherry picks that verse and goes, oh, this means we're not under law anymore, we're now under grace, and we're forgiven, we can forget about all of that stuff. But if we go back just couple I mean, read the whole chapter, but in particular, we go back to verse 12. It says, therefore, do not let sin rule in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. First off, if you're not letting sin rule, that means you're actively trying not to sin, right? So if it's grace versus law and we're under grace, so we don't have to worry about law anymore. How are we actively trying not to sin? And do not keep yielding your body's part, your body parts to sin as tools of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your body parts as tools of righteousness to God. Verse 14, again, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace and continues on. We like to stop there because it's way too easy to cherry pick than it is to actually read things for what God is saying, and we continue on, verse 15, what then? 
what then? Talking about grace, we're, we're under grace, not under law. So what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be, or many translations say, heaven forbid. Do you not know that the, that to whatever you yield yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to what you obey, whether to sin resulting in death or to obedience resulting in righteousness? Or to what? to obedience resulting in righteousness. The option is of slavery to sin or slavery to obedience. And then he carries on, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching under which you were placed. And after you were f- set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. And enslaved to righteousness is what? Well, he's already covered it. It's obedience to righteousness. It's being obedient right. and, because of righteousness. And when we read this, you were reading from Romans there, yeah. but when we read from Romans, and from some of these other books that we read in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament, we have to remember that Romans was written to believers. It starts out with to the believers in Rome. So this isn't talking about how to be saved. It's talking about how to stay how one to who's following salvation. along. I, I wrote a thing the other day that said uh, that First John says sin is a transgression of the law. Well, if the law is done away with, then nobody can sin, and if nobody can sin, then nobody needs a savior. Uh, that that's the the end result of that kind of thought, but that's not the way the scriptures actually present things or are designed. It's just our bad reason, reasoning and reading of the text because we want to make it so we have no responsibility to actually follow or obey God. Uh, earlier, Rabbi David said, uh, he, you know, people are comfortable saying or, or popularly saying, you know, God meets us where we are. I think the reality, though, is that just as John, Rabbi Jonathan said earlier, when Moses was talking to the Lord, he said, "Do not, re- if I've found grace, do not remove your presence. God's presence is is everywhere. God doesn't come to meet us somewhere. What ha- really happens is we recognize he's there, that he is everywhere, and that our eyes are opened at some point to see his presence, to see evidence of him being there. And that's grace. When our eyes are opened up to see where we are, and in that case, Moses is talking about Israel and their sin and saying, if, 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 if you take if you leave if your presence leaves we're done for there's nothing here and same thing in our life when we come to a place where we realize that we're sinners in need of God he's there and we see his presence and his presence in our life is grace but that's not where we stay we don't just meet God where we are and then he says okay just stay where you are you're fine now that you know I exist you have no responsibility, and just because you recognize that I am present, uh, you're okay. No, it, it, it's follow me, and, and that's what the rest of the conversation Moses has with the Lord in that text is. You have to follow me. You have to take the land. You have to do what I say. You have to go where I lead. Yeah. Um, I, I, for me, this is Rabbi Toby, by the way. Um, for me, the biggest problem and. I have an issue with the grace versus law because the word verses. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the biggest, one of the biggest problems I think is in the, in the Bible, there is a blank piece of paper between uh, the old and new Testament. Yeah. It's the biggest heresy in the common Bible. I I think it's the biggest problem because people look at old Testament, new Testament as two different, almost, I mean, like two different things, Mm -hmm. two different gods. Right. And Yes, and um, very much so because you hear the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament right. all the time. <clears throat> and um, I just I was looking at what Paul said in Romans chapter three because uh, I think that th- the biggest thing in understanding it's not grace versus law; it's 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 both that they work together, um, and it's understanding how Yeshua causes us to relate to the Torah differently um, as 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 a as uh, as a, a an author of a new covenant. Uh, but Paul says in Romans 3, verse 20, he says, For no human on the basis of Torah observance will be set right in his sight. For through the Torah comes awareness of sin. So I think in that sentence, Paul defines the purpose of grace and the purpose of the Torah. He says, But now God's righteousness apart from the Torah has been revealed. That's not saying that God created a righteousness apart from Torah I think Yeshua revealed it in its fullness, but if we go back into Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, 
God had grace all throughout it. I just think Yeshua revealed God's righteousness apart from Torah observance in its fullness. But you have to look at the purpose of grace and the purpose of the law. The purpose of the Torah was not to set us right. That's what grace does. It's grace. Grace sets us right. It says they are set right. This is verse 24 of chapter 3 of Romans. They are set right as a gift of his grace. Um, and, and I don't know why I keep seeing. I just go back to an example in the Tanakh of when King David, he wasn't king at the time. He was on the run. He had to eat the showbread. Mm-hmm. That was against the law, correct? Yeah. He was not supposed to eat that bread. But he was on the run, and they were hungry. Him and his men were on the run, and I, I, I'm trying to remember the exact. I, I don't have it in front of me because I got the book. I got the Bible open to Romans, but yeah. he ate some of the showbread. That was grace. God was giving David grace, and he was using grace. He was not applying the law. Yeah, yeah it was actually that particular passage of scripture, that particular event that we read about about David and the showbread. People misconstrue, and, and I like the way you said it, and, and applying grace to it. But if you read what happens, David comes up to the tabernacle, to the to to the to, to the Cohen. And, and, to Cohen, and he asks the Cohen. He says, "I know that's not for me, right. but I'm going to die without that." And the yes. high priest then says, "Yes, this belongs to me. This is mine, mm-hmm. but I'm giving it to you so that you can be sustained and have life because without what I have that's mine, you're not going to do it." Now, it wasn't David's until the priest gave it to him right. and thus making it righteous for David to have. Just like our we come to the Lord sinners. Mm-hmm. And we we don't have righteous. We don't have the bread of life. We don't have that uh, available to us. But we go to our high priest Yeshua, who then says, "Even though this isn't yours, right? This is mine. My Father gave this to me. I'm letting you have it to be sustained." And bread is symbolic to the Torah, to the bread of life, to uh, to what God has given us to sus- to sustain us. And Yeshua didn't say. Okay, there's bread here, and this is the bread of life, and this is what sustains us, and this is what gets replaced every seven days in the tabernacle. This is what the priest eat. Uh, and it's here, but I'm going to give you this swine or this right. pizza or whatever going on. He actually gave what was established to preserve life to the people that needed it, even though they didn't qualify to be it. Remember, initially... It was God's plan that all Israel would be priests. It wasn't until Israel rebelled that the outer curtain goes up, the separation, and then ultimately Aaron is told, you can't enter the holy place except when I call you because of sin. So sin entered in and made this separation between the priest who served as an intercessor and the people who were the receivers of that intercession. And because of that, the bread became belonging to the priest and not to David and his men. But David and his men are starving, and they realize we're going to die without this, you interceding for us. Mm -hmm. So can we have your bread? And that's what what he gave, and that's why Yeshua, I am the bread of life. If you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my – all of that is connected to this idea that we didn't deserve it. Yes. But remember that David still had to go to – the tabernacle, to the temple, yes. to to get what it was. He didn't just go to McDonald's or Burger King or whatever to get whatever he wanted to. He returned to where God's presence was and then partook of that which belonged to the high priest so that he could right. be sustained, and it's exactly the same as it is in our life. It didn't belong to him, and it was sin for him to have it without it right. being given to him by the priest. Yes, and I think that that goes back to the central argument. I think that's the central grace versus, I mean, grace and law debate, because when I think of Yeshua talking to the Pharisees, I think that, I think that, and not all Pharisees were were bad, uh, but I'm saying that the ones he was arguing with, I think that's kind of his point was, I think that uh, had you had some of those Pharisees that Yeshua was arguing with back then, 
I think some of that would have been like, well, no, David, you can't have it because they were yeah. legalistic obs- observance, you know? Right, and that goes to when Yeshua's disciples reached up and grabbed the corn in the field and were eating, or the wheat, rather, grain, and grain, the yeah. grain, and they're eating it. And they say, your disciples are, are gathering on or Shabbat. Harvesting on Shabbat. And they're not supposed to. When there was no commandment against reaching up and getting something to eat for yourself, the commandment was against harvesting right. and, and, and doing, which is different. But the rabbis and their, uh, the Pharisees in self-righteousness had added to God's word a prohibition that didn't exist and then applied that prohibition to the disciples and accused them of failing to follow the Torah. Yeah. And that's what we're dealing with here is this idea that uh, that our man-made rules of Torah supersede God's rules, and then because we can't keep our rules, you put a yoke on them, you, either, you couldn't bear neither your father's. Uh, we've decided that we're just going to do away with the yoke altogether and say grace does away with the yoke and we don't have any responsibility. Right. And I, and, and just to circle back to the, basically the point I was making, um, and absolutely, I, I, I agree with that. And, and I think just, just, just to put it to rest, the point I was making was just that the key is to remove the uh, – the partition between Old and New Testament, looking at God's Word as a whole, understanding that the law and the Torah is still very much alive, and so is grace. They work together, so it's understanding what the purpose of the law is now yeah. in the New Covenant and what the purpose of grace is. And we, I think the purpose of grace, Paul makes very clear, grace sets us right, not the Torah. So what does the Torah do? Yeah, and I think uh, I think one of the problems is that because the body of Messiah has developed this idea of because of grace at the cross, we no longer have to worry about obedience to commandments. Realistically, what we've done is created an atmosphere in which there's no definition of sin, yeah. right? As Rabbi Eric said earlier, First John says, if uh, first Rabbi Eric said, First John says that the, that um, sin is the transgression of the law, right? So how do we define sin? Well, we define sin by breaking God's commandments. What does that look like? Well, the scripture gives us clear outline and, and description. The problem is, is in order to live that out, we have to be willing to fully and wholeheartedly submit every single aspect of our lives to the presence of the Lord. Yeah. But if we just eliminate the commandments, if we just eliminate the obedience factor, we don't have to submit anything, right? Uh, it, it's so much easier if we just say, look, we can do whatever we want because we're under grace, not law. Like we said a couple of weeks ago with Matt, uh, talking about the Jerusalem Council and Acts 15, you know, if those four issues are the only thing Gentiles have to worry about. Dude, Gentiles got it easy because they can murder anybody, right? right? Somebody makes you mad, you can murder them, and that's okay. Now, I'm not saying the Gentiles can murder people. Yeah. Uh, that it was clearly a sarcastic reality. But I think when we go back to Matthew 5, and it's for me, I talk about this a lot at CMC, is everything that we do within the context of Messianic Judaism should be centrally focused on Yeshua first. It should be filtered through our faith in Yeshua first, not filtered through Jewish tradition or practice or, or, or whatever. It should be filtered through our faith in Yeshua first. And if what we are doing, whether it's Jewish tradition and practice or not, is not in uh, alignment with a filtration through Yeshua, then perhaps we need to consider eliminating those or better facilitating how to live those out so it can. And when we look at Yeshua's words in Matthew 5, and this is like the great Messianic passage, right? We hear Messianic rabbis use this all the time. Matthew five seventeen says, do not think <laughs> That I came to abolish the Torah of the prophets. Again, if you got a red letter Bible, this is bright red letters. This is Yeshua's words himself speaking. Do not think that I have come to abolish the Torah of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen. I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or serif, uh, a lot of translations will say jot and tittle, shall ever pass away from the Torah until all things have come to pass. Now, last I checked, we're still here. Messiah has not come back. His uh, eternal reign has not been established here on the new heaven and new Jerusalem, or the new Jerusalem, uh, new heaven, new new Jerusalem here on earth. Um, we're not in that place where all things have come to pass yet. And he goes on, therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others the same shall be called the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps and teaches them, this one shall be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to stop there because I, I want to point out uh, Yeshua doesn't say that obeying the commandments is a matter of salvation. Our salvation is the blood of the lamb 
only. Right. And I think that's where the problem comes in is so many people are hooked on this grace versus law thing because they think that obedience to the Torah means that we're trying to earn heavenly brownie points to keep our salvation, to maintain our salvation, to get our salvation. But God is our bridegroom and we are his bride. And it's not like in a, 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 a human relationship between a husband and a bride where, you know, as a husband, if I mess up and I forget to do something my wife asked me to do that I think if I bring her a pack of Reese's peanut butter cups, it's going to make all things right, right? That's not what we're looking at. We're not trying, by the way, that is her favorite candy. So, uh, but we're, so, we're, so definitely bring her Reese's. It, it, it would bring her happiness <laughs> at least momentarily. It would not fix the problem. But, uh, yeah, but the, reality, the problem would be to do the things she asked you exactly. to do. Exactly. Yeah. At the very least, to recognize the error and yeah. fix it. Yeah. You know, you can't go back in time and, and undo something you didn't do, but you can go and fix it. You can yeah. go and, and do it the right way. And so I think we have this idea of grace versus law because we think if we're trying to keep Shabbat or Kashrut or uh, um, take a, a, a mikvah, a tevila, yeah. baptism, uh, scripturally for, for cleanliness sake, not just for water immersion, for remission of sin, but on a regular basis things like this we think that this is trying to earn something but none of us I don't know a Messianic rabbi that teaches Torah observancy that believes that our observance of Torah has anything to do with our salvation what I will say is that if we are truly bought by the blood of the Lamb, then there should be a progression in our walk in faith in the Lord and our willingness to submit more and more and more of our lives daily to Him. Yeah. And the beauty is is that our ability to come to terms with that and to strive to walk that out by the leading of His Ruach HaKodesh, of His Holy Spirit, is the prime example of the work of grace in our life, which should be to draw us back to obedience and faithfulness to the word of God, not for salvation, but because of salvation. Everything I do, I don't do to earn anything. I do because God has freely given, right? The least I can do out of everything God's done for me, the very least I can do is to obey his word. Yeah. And it follows God's pattern. I mean, you know, Israel, before they even got the commandments, Israel was redeemed from Egypt. You know, Israel was quote unquote saved before. Right. And then, you know, they crossed through the waters, mikvah, and then then they received yeah. the instructions. And then, you know, I mean, and then it took them, you know, immediately after receiving just the first 10, which we can talk about, you know, whether or not those were the later. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they, uh, they, 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 jump right into idolatry you know immediately so there's a, there's a, so there's this understanding that you know and i think when people don't um in, in the larger christian world when people don't read quote unquote the old testament when they don't read the torah they miss a lot of those patterns that god works with mankind works with israel through and you know that that yes this person let's say israel an individual was redeemed was born again, was immersed in waters, your sin is washed right. away, and they're receiving instruction from God, learning better how to walk with God, and then they trip and fall, boom. You know, I fall into sin, uh, maybe an old temptation, we don't know. But then they should do what Moses led Israel to do, which is to repent. Right. You know, and, that, and that's where, you know, I don't understand, you know, necessarily how people get to the point where they go, well, it's, you know, grace and law are separate. No, they're, they're com- compl- you know, complicatedly intertwined yes together and it's one of the um it, it always blows my mind when especially more conservative denominations look around the world today look at the church today look at great the greater body of messiah today and go how did we get here how do we have churches that support gay marriage how do we have churches that support you know mutilating children and you know allowing them to change genders how, how do we allow how did we get here but if you look at the argument throughout church history, especially Protestant history of this, you know, quote unquote, grace versus law argument, it's the natural conclusion. Yeah, the to progressive at. end yeah. mm-hmm. of that direction right. is if we have no responsibility to God's commandments, and if grace covers all our sin, and if God's commandments are no longer in effect towards us, then none of that stuff matters, and thus. Grace overpowers Torah to the point where there is no Torah, yeah. and ultimately that results in really no grace. Yeah, it's not grace anymore. It's licentiousness. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. piggybacking on that, continuing in the conversation of Matthew 5, uh, and, and I'm just going to paraphrase these because it's more interesting to word it this way, but uh, when, we're, when we're looking at Yeshua's uh, 
continue teaching here, which by the way, Matthew five is uh, part of, of what we often call the Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew five, six, seven is all one large uh, teaching that flows together. And so we, we just talked about that. I've come not to, to do away with, but to fulfill. Uh, but he goes on to say, for uh, uh, you've heard it said it's a sin to commit murder. But I tell you, if you've even hated somebody in your heart, you've already committed that sin. And you've heard it's a sin to commit adultery. But I tell you, if you've even lusted in your heart, you've already committed that sin. Um, and, and what's interesting is, first off, he wasn't saying anything new, right? All four of those issues, murder and hatred, adultery and lust, were all dealt with in the Torah, right? He's not saying as long as you don't hate somebody, you can murder all you want. Just make sure you're murdering out of love, right? right. And, and he's not saying as long as you're not lusting after the woman you're cheating on your wife for, you can cheat on her with whoever you want. Just don't lust for for her, right? He's not saying any of that. He's not saying one negates the other. Instead, what he's saying is, is for every external sin, there's an internal sin that prompts it, yeah. right? And he says, if you let me handle the internal, the external can't sin. Right. And what he's saying there, which is interesting and, and really important for us to follow, is when he says, I didn't come to do away with the law, but to bring it to fullness, the rest of chapter 5, he gives examples of exactly what that means. In other words, he says, here's what the law is. The law says if you murder somebody, but let me bring you to fullness of that. The fullness says if you hate somebody in your heart, you've already murdered. And then he says, the law says don't commit adultery, but I say if you lust in your heart, you've already uh, committed adultery. So he's showing us what the fullness of the commandment actually is. He's not saying, yeah. you know, we're doing away with this, or, or and he's not establishing new law. He's just saying that, as you yeah. said, the root is this. This is the result. Yeah. The infection is lust. The symptom. Yeah. Is adultery. And if and if we believe, which as as followers of Yeshua, we 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 all agree with this. If we believe that Yeshua resides within our hearts. And we believe that his Ruach HaKodesh, his Holy Spirit, is at work within us. Then what Yeshua was getting at in Matthew 5 is the, the, the fulfillment of the Jeremiah 31 promise of the new covenant, which verse 30, Jeremiah 31 verse 30 begins. It says, Behold, days are coming. It is a declaration of Adonai when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenants I made with their fathers. In the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, it is a declaration. Declaration of Adonai in verse 32, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. It is a declaration of Adonai. I will put my Torah within them. Yes, I will write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will each teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, no, Adonai, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. It is a declaration of Adonai for I will forgive their iniquity, their sin I will remember no more. And that idea of the new covenant, I believe wholeheartedly is the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh and, and, and Messiah Yeshua within our hearts and our lives, where literally the word made flesh now resides within us. It is etched upon the flesh of our heart. And when Yeshua says, if you let me handle the inside, the outside can't be a problem. I said earlier, if we're trying to write off commandments, it's not because we truly believe they affect our faith in the in the grace and mercy of Yeshua. It's that we're just simply trying to not submit more of our lives to the Lord. And if we truly have Messiah in our hearts and our lives, we truly have the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, leading our steps, our breath, our words, our thoughts, then we will be willing to to submit more and more and more to him because of the circumcision of the heart, because of the etching upon the flesh of our hearts of the new covenant, the renewed covenant of the word of God. And as we, be, as we begin to wrap up this episode, when we go back to Romans, Romans talks about the circumcision of the heart of a believer, and it goes – is a quote from Deuteronomy – where in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, and uh, the whole chapter beginning in that area, but it talks about when God gathers his people together again after they've been scattered because of their disobedience, he says, I will circumcise their hearts, and then they will begin to keep my commandments that were commanded this day again. So the heart thing happens first, and please understand that none of us are saying in any way that you can work your way just by obeying God's commandments to a right, right relationship with God. Your heart has to first be circumcised. The Torah has to be planted in your heart first. God's word, his love, his mercy, his grace has to affect your heart. And then your response to that 
is that way. Uh, you know, when my kids were small, uh, we used to have to chase them around the house to get them to take a shower. Uh, you know, and and get clean clothes on. They want to wear the same clothes all the time. They, you know, and you dealt with that. But then they got to be around eleven, twelve, thirteen. They come in, you know, a mindset of the opposite sex, and suddenly they were girls to, exist. Girls exist, and they didn't really have cooties. And suddenly they were wanting to take showers in the morning and showers in the evening. They wanted to have deodorant and cologne, and they wanted to have things to and and certain clothes. And they they couldn't wear a pair of pants more than once, and they were changing clothes two or three times a day. Now that wasn't because clothing changed, and it wasn't because of any of that. But they had a heart change. Something within them changed, yeah. and resulted in their behavior changing. And that's the same way that happens with us. You might be filthy in sin, like my boys were, who who didn't care about. And suddenly, some uh, filthy in sin, as in filthy dirty. My son looked at me like, <laughs> no, no, I, you know, I actually, oddly enough, not that way. No, I had, I had, I had, a, I had a thought. I was telling. Uh, I think it may have been Rabbi Toby at our Tosh Leak, or maybe somebody else, but uh, at our Tosh Leak service on Rosh Hashanah out at the the bay. Uh, you know, we're casting bread in, and it's interaction with the, the, the promise that God would cast our sins in the depths of the sea and never to be seen again. And uh, I was telling him about this time when uh, when Andrew was little, my little brother when he was little, um, that we were at it doing Tashlik with our synagogue in, in Mobile, and uh, my brother's like grabbing handfuls of bread and just throwing handfuls in the water. And one of the ladies from the, the synagogue comes over and goes, hey, it's okay. You only have to throw a little bit. It doesn't have to. You don't have to go. He turns around to her just dead straight face and goes you don't know how bad i've been this year (laughs) (laughs) i had a lot of sin to deal with so we we all are sinners born in sin shape and iniquity we all realize and recognize at some point the presence of god which results in our humbling ourselves before him and acknowledging his grace and his mercy and that's the starting point. And beyond that, then we start adapting and adopting the ways of God into our life so that by our actions, our Father would be glorified, yeah. not so that we would, not so we look better, so, but so that others see him through our actions. Amen. Yeah. Just, oh, I was going to say, ahead, no, your mention of Cologne, it's like, you know what always confused me as a kid was when ladies would rave about the toilet water they would receive. Yeah, ode like, to toilet. For, I was like, man— you know, as a nine-year-old, you're like, why is toilet water the thing you want to be wearing on a date? You know, but because I just didn't know what it was at the time. But since we're in Romans, you know, I love that you know Paul. You know, he writes often about being a, becoming a slave to righteousness, which is, you know, I love his language because it, I, I had someone had sent me a thesis one time about. Um, uh, and I'm a history guy, so for those of you who don't know, so I, I, I try to bring that to my my studies, especially with the Bible, just for context. That you know, the the word you know uh, for grace, I think it's charis in Greek. Is that it? I don't. I have to. I, I wish I had a note in front of me, but um, the 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 understanding of grace uh, in the Roman world, in the Greek Greco Roman world, was that um, it was similar to how a lot of companies um, and even uh, the military do. Um, today with like education. So for example, there's a lot of companies, uh, the U S army does the same thing where you come serve us for so many years, we will pay for your education. We'll pay for you to go to college In the Greco Roman world. You know, if you were, let's say you didn't have the money to put forth a business or to buy some land or something. And you had a rich sponsor mm-hmm. put money towards whatever it was you needed, whether it was a, you know, a, a, for land or for some business enterprise, it could be multiple things, or just to get you out of debt. They could be purchasing your family's debt and to buy. And they were buying your name back, essentially, for mm-hmm. your family um, and for your children. On um, there was this expectation that your life would be lived in service, and not like not not necessarily a slave. Like you were, you you had to go and you know shackle yourself to their household and become you know uh, you know someone who was you know beaten. If the, if you didn't right. bring them the bread at the right time, but someone who, when they said, "Hey, I need you to do this," your life was obligated to jump at the sound of their voice. Where they said, "Hey, would you mind running an errand for me?" You went and ran the errand. 
you know, it was it was there, there was this understanding that your life was forever, you know, indebted to them. So you didn't owe a debt to someone who was going to be harmful or you know treat you wrongly. It's the same thing with us with sin. You know, sin will deal rather badly on the, and the on this side of things with us. And then if we continue to live in sin, it will you know God will deal with us on the other end. And we you don't want to be found in that position, right? Better to be a slave of righteousness and to embrace the grace, to embrace the fact that your sin was dealt with by Messiah and that now your life is obligated mm -hmm. to obedience to him forever and eternity. And to, to be the one who says, here am I, when he calls. Right. Yeah, and, and by no way are we saying that uh, that means our obedience is going to be perfect even after we uh, are, are showered with God's grace and after we encounter God, you know, it's, but it's, it's like what John says in first John, you know, my children, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. Yep. So John's saying, don't go nuts. I'm not telling you to do that. He's saying, I'm, I'm writing these things to you so you don't sin. He goes, but if anyone does, we have an intercessor. So God's grace is continually applied. So yeah, we're not saying that we believe there's a standard of perfection you can reach. So now, as we get ready to close out uh, this episode, I actually just wanted to do something a little fun, a little informative uh, to kind of separate from the, the topic of the day. Uh, and that is, I just wanted to, to, to ask our rabbis uh, in this podcast, uh, and, and we may do something like this from time to time. We had a question uh, come in online asking about resources that we recommend to learn more about Messianic Judaism. And I thought this would be a really interesting way to share that. And that is, uh, what is one of the most uh, important and or influential books that you can think of that has affected your life as a follower of Messianic Judaism, and uh, you know, whether that's a a book within kind of the 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 categorization of Messianic Judaism or outside of it, really doesn't matter to me. Just a book that was really a blessing to you and helped in developing your walk within Messianic Judaism. So I'll let you guys kind of jump on it, and I'll, I'll share mine last. I'll go first. Yeah. And uh, one of the most impactful books that I've read was a book written by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. Uh, it's entitled, To the Ends of the Earth, How the First Jewish Followers of Yeshua Transformed the Ancient World. And, you know, we, we don't have a lot of resources that talk about the early believers and their expanse from Jerusalem out to the nations and how they impacted the nations and ultimately changed the entire world as a result of of their experience. So if uh, if you haven't read the book, I'm going to give the title one more time. It's To the Ends of the Earth, How the First Jewish Followers of Yeshua Transformed the Ancient World. It's available on Amazon and other places. It's by Dr. Jeffrey Seif, S-E-I-F, and uh, I encourage you to uh, pick it up and check it out if you're interested in the history of the early Messianic Jewish movement. And uh, for me, this, uh, it, there was a small book um, by Darren Huckey uh, that I had read years ago called The Four Responsibilities of a Disciple. And um, I, it was just coming into the Messianic movement, and uh, it completely changed how I view discipleship. Um, you know, I'd all, I'd grown up and in sort of just with this understanding that discipleship was a class you attended or, you know, a curriculum you worked through and that was it. And that you, you, you kind of, as long as you were faithful to that and it, you know, kind of let it grow you, that was discipleship. And, I, but the book challenged me that discipleship was all inclusive. It wasn't just the Wednesday evening service that you attended that was called the discipleship class or, you know, discipleship 101, but it was you're committing yourself to Yeshua. You're committing yourself to the teacher, the discipler, mm -hmm. and becoming a disciple. And that it involves every aspect of your life, not just the moral things, not just the religious things, but you know how you how you handle your money, how you handle uh, clothing, you know how you handle you know uh, regular life decisions. It's all inclusive. And so uh, that book is uh, Four Responsibilities of a Disciple. Uh, by Darren Huggy. It can be found on Amazon, and it, it completely changed how I view discipleship. And so I really – it's a short book. I think it's only like 100 pages or so. And so if, 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 it's, if you are looking to change radically how you view discipleship and being a disciple of Yeshua or even being a disciple of a rabbi or a teacher um, you know, in your congregation, I would encourage you to read that book. Um, I think for me um – 
there's a book by Sid Roth that's called They Thought for Themselves. Mm. Um, it was actually gifted to me by a non-believer, um, a guy that I worked with. Um, I remember he. Uh, we both worked at a school. We were both teachers. And he was leaving to move to another school, and as he was leaving, he said, hey, you know, here's a gift. And he wrote this really kind um, uh, note in it just about how, like, you know, uh, I think you're a great guy. He goes, your faith has obviously brought you a long way. And, you know, even though, you know, I don't know what kind of impact it had on him, he never said, oh, I'm a believer now. But obviously uh, my uh, imperfect, though striving walk, you know, uh, uh, we uh, we stumble to find Yeshua's footsteps in life. Um, he, um, was obviously moved by, you know, my, my, again, uh, devotion to God that I do my best to do every day. But, uh, that book, uh, I read it and I just thought it was amazing that he gave it to me. You know, the guy wasn't even a believer. He wasn't even Jewish. Um, but he knew I was a messian- messianic believer, uh, even though I'm not Jewish and Gentile, but, uh, I read that book and it's stories about how Jewish people came to faith. Um, and it's it's modern stories, like I'd say probably in the past, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, but it's just whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, I would recommend you read that book. It's incredibly exciting, especially when you understand the prophetic significance of the Jewish people receiving Messiah Yeshua. And the stories are just incredible. Um, Barry, uh, let's see, Batya Siegel, who's, you know, a classic, legendary, messianic, you know, mu- musician, uh, her, her testimony's in there. And it's just really, really awesome, uh, again, whether you're Jewish or not, to read They Thought for Themselves and just to see how the Messiah is revealing himself to the Jewish people, the firstborn of God's chosen people, um, and, and how he's revealed themselves to them. And it's just really, really awesome. And, and to see that even being non Jewish, to be a part of something that God's moving so vibrantly in, uh, in preparation, I believe for the coming of Messiah. So for me, uh, it's, it's definitely no doubt the book, uh, Messianic Judaism, a modern movement with an ancient past by Dr. David Stern of blessed memory. Um, and I actually first read it. I own it in both, uh, in both of its iterations. I first read it when it was still titled Messianic Jewish Manifesto, which is what Dr. David Stern originally wrote it as. And then, uh, a, a few years back, it was, uh, maybe late nineties, early two thousands. It was retitled as Messianic Judaism, a modern movement with an ancient past. Um, absolutely phenomenal book. Uh, and, um, one, one of the things that I love about it is it is a very, uh, theological, theologically heavy book, but it's written where it's really easy for anybody to pick it up and understand. It's very well organized and thought out. Uh, but basically, he goes through almost every little nook and crevice of what is Messianic Judaism uh, and and tries to kind of interact and wrestle with that. And he he really was a groundbreaker. Uh, unfortunately, he just passed away uh, uh, recently, but he really was a groundbreaker in terms of Messianic theological thought and works and putting um, putting to print what our our thoughts and, and opinions are. And there's, I don't know, like with all of us, I'm sure with each of these books that were just mentioned, I don't necessarily agree with every word that was written in the book, but it's a phenomenal book and it gives you a great idea of a foundation of what Messianic Judaism really is. With this podcast in the 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 uh, description will be links of all of these books that you can uh, find uh, so that it's really easy for you to get access to them uh, and go to look for them yourself. Yeah, and we, uh, we hope this podcast has been a blessing to you today. Um, hopefully this discussion has encouraged you to, if you, depending on where you end up on this argument, to look more into this discussion of grace versus law. If you're not quite convinced that, you know, they both go hand in hand and together, or they're not separate, they're not one versus the other, uh, we want to encourage you to go and to look and study more. Read your Bible, and you will find that our God indeed is the God who never changes, and praise God for that. So uh, with that said, we want to wish you a blessed week and a blessed Shabbat, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast.